Back then, just like it is today, predominantly white schools had better educational opportunity. So by 1957, the president enforced the law that every school in America must now be integrated. The governor at the time of Arkansas wasn't having it. We'll let the, this little short clip tell the rest of the story, and I'll just step in from time to time with my own. Until 1954, segregation laws in some states forbade black students from attending the same schools as white students. In 1954, the United States Supreme Court outlawed segregation throughout the country and ordered that white-only schools must be open to African-American students with all deliberate speed. The governor of the state of Arkansas vowed to defy the order. Blood will run in the streets if Negro pupils should attempt to enter Central High School, he said. Now, just think about that for a minute. This is the governor, and the year is 1957. In the great scheme of things, 1957 isn't long ago. It's remarkable. The school board of the city of Little Rock, Arkansas, planned otherwise. To comply with the Supreme Court order, the school board of the city of Little Rock announced that the city's all-white secondary school could now accept black students. On the first day of school in September 1957, nine African-American children, later referred to as the Little Rock Nine, planned to enroll in Little Rock Central High School. Elizabeth Eckford was one of the nine. The Little Rock School Board asked parents of the nine students not to accompany their children to school because the board feared that the presence of African-American parents would incite a mob. The governor of Arkansas sent the National Guard into Little Rock, claiming that there was a danger of violence. Now, what made this especially newsworthy, and the reason why it got national and even worldwide uh, attention, was the fact that one of the black children didn't get the word that all nine were to be escorted and then marched into school. So she got separated. For made for all nine students to meet off campus and approach the school accompanied by a lawyer and under military protection. Because the Eckford family had no telephone, Elizabeth was unaware of the arrangements, so she set out alone. When she got off the bus near Central High School, Elizabeth saw a crowd of angry white people and hundreds of armed soldiers whom the governor had sent to prevent the nine students from entering the school. Elizabeth thought she might be safe if she walked behind the Arkansas soldiers to the school entrance. Believing the guards were present to protect her, she tried to pass through the line several times before being forced back into the white crowd. The crowd began to follow me, calling me names. All of a sudden, my knees began to shake, and I wondered whether I could make it. It was the longest block I ever walked in my whole life. Take a brief moment to think about what's going on right now. This is a high school student lambasted by hundreds of white people, young and old. You can imagine all sorts of racial slurs and names that she's being called. And I think about today's teenagers, especially the females, because this woman here is a female, who complain about getting the wrong nail color or not having the latest and greatest iPhone. Oh, and here's my favorite, body shaming, microaggressions. Even so, I was not too scared because I thought the guards would protect me. When I got in front of the school, I went up to a guard again, but he just looked straight ahead and did not move to let me pass. I did not know what to do. Just then, another guard let some white students through. When I tried to squeeze past him, he raised his bayonet. Somebody started yelling, lynch her, lynch her. I tried to see a friendly face. I made eye contact with an old woman, but she spat on me. Now, again, this is 1957. I looked down the block and saw a bench at the bus stop. I ran to the bench and sat down. Some of the crowd followed Elizabeth to the bench, shouting, drag her over to the tree, a way of saying they would lynch her. As Elizabeth sat on the bench for what seemed like an eternity, a white woman named Grace Lorch made her way through the crowd and spoke to Elizabeth. Elizabeth slowly lifted her eyes and looked up at the stranger. Then she got up. Walking close beside her, the woman guided her to a nearby bus stop. Elizabeth got on the bus and escaped from the mob. Over the next few weeks, the governor continued to fight federal authorities until finally, on September 24, President Eisenhower federalized the Arkansas National Guard control and ordered the 101st Airborne Division to escort the nine students into the school. For the remainder of the school year, the Guard accompanied the students from class to class. The Little Rock Nine eventually succeeded in integrating Central High School. Elizabeth later received a degree in history from the Central State College in Wilberforce, Ohio. She served in the United States Army for several years and found employment as a social worker and substitute teacher. Elizabeth returned to Little Rock in 1974 to live in her family's home, the only one of the nine to return to that city to live. And even more remarkable that years later, she wanted to return to her hometown. And, you know, I honestly couldn't. 1999, 42 years later after the crisis, Elizabeth and the other Little Rock Nine students received the Congressional Gold Medal from President Clinton as a permanent remembrance of their unforgettable moment of courage.